So, uh, thank you. Um, I know a lot of you, uh, and a lot of you see me out on the at Steamboat Golf Course a lot. I tell people I play golf frequently and not necessarily well. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure about the history part of it, if I'm a good historian, just an amateur historian, but I got interested in it because uh, when Steamboat Golf Club was approaching their 50th anniversary, which they thought was 2014, uh, 2015, 15, 14, excuse me, they, um, I said, well, where's the history of the golf course? And I was asking questions, and they said, oh, we don't really have that. We have this here. We have some minutes there and stuff. And I started researching. Uh, and as I dug into it more and more, I was like, wow, there's a lot here. Um, so I'm going to divide the history of the Steamboat Golf Course into two eras. The first era I call the Every Man's Era. And that was the era from about 1900 all the way to 1974. And that's the era when, if you wanted to do golf in Steamboat Springs, you got together with a bunch of your friends and you built your own golf course. And you put things together, but you were gonna make it the best golf course possible. Um, and it also, the history of the golf courses really reflects our community and our place in our agricultural, ag agrarian roots, and our beautiful scenery, and our fiscal conservatism. When I, when I was looking at the patterns. So, um, the 1923 to 73 era. Um, the dream of a golf course actually began in Steamboat Springs in 1908. It was the very first mention in the Steamboat Pilot and uh, a man by the name of F.A. Metcalf, who was a local real estate agent, said, I think we should build a golf course. And he was trying to get people ready for the golf course. And then World War I happened. And so there was no golf course for a while. When World War I ended, same group got together again, and they said, no, we're going to build it. So if you build it, they will come. <laughs> they built a nine-hole golf course up on Crawford Hill. Um, and that golf course was established, actually, in 1923. So in 1923, we had our first golf course. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit from the book here about the beginnings of that. In 1923, Steamboat Springs finally had its first nine-hole golf course. The course was built on a 50-acre tract near the home of Mrs. Violet Fletcher on Crawford Hill. As would be the case for several decades, the work of designing and building the course would fall on the ordinary citizens of the community without the use of golf course architects, designers, or other experts. The local paper, the Steamboat Pilot, reported that a new golf course club was being formed and that 30 applications had already been submitted. As the club submitted new applications, they made it clear that all were welcome and that membership in the Sequoia Club was not required to be in the golf club. Golf was truly often running in Steamboat Springs with a very devoted, enthusiastic, and excited group of players ready to try out the links. The course was a source of civic pride and in a bit of lo local bravado was touted as, quote, being equal to many of the municipal courses around the country. <laughs> Since there was really no objective way to measure the veracity of that bold claim, the steamboat pilot and the dedicated golfers of the day were free to make the claim without fear of being contradicted. While, the di while no diagrams of the course layout can be found, there are records of the yardage and other details of the course design. The course had a total yardage of 2,583 yards. 
Um, what was interesting was that course lasted three years. It only lasted three years because, and this will be ironic for a golf course, the grass grew too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to remember, it was 1923. So you didn't have all that equipment that you see going up and down golf courses these days. Uh, you were more likely to have sheep grazing <laughs> and things like that to cut it down. And of course, if the grass grows too high, you can't find your ball. And I don't know about you people, but I have a hard enough time sometimes finding my ball. So um, they said, oh, we've got to move it to a different place. So they did move it. And they moved it to the area by Lithia Springs. <coughs> um, so Lithia Springs now is over by, on 13th Street. Uh, at the time, it was known as Moffat Avenue, not 13th Street. And um, what they did is they said, we will build a new golf course here. The site was about 60 acres. So it was a pretty good sized site. Um, but here was something that I've recently discovered both for that first course, and now what I'll call the second course, there was never a purchase of any land. What happened is people basically went to a landowner or somebody and said, can we put a golf course here? Sure, you can put a golf course here. And then the original owners of the Steamboat Town Site Company said, this is city land. They didn't say what had to be on it, what you had to do, any of that. So the 20s and 30s, a lot less regulation. And they put the second course there. Um, and this is the only picture we've been able to find about the golf course. Lush, isn't it? <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. And what I really like is the concrete tea boxes. Okay, uh, if you go to that site, and I've walked the site a couple of times now, I can't find any traces of any of the concrete boxes. But you've got to remember that this site went out of service now almost 70 years ago. So you're probably not going to find those those artifacts. This is the Fairview site? This is the Fairview site. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, right now there's that light industrial, the bus garages, the Humane Society, all of that is, is over there. And if you look at the open area over by the, the power areas, and you just think for a minute, you can look at it and say, I could see somebody saying this is a good open area for a golf course. Mm -hmm. But boy, are the flies and mosquitoes nasty over there. Okay, you don't want to, you don't want to be over there. So um, they, they moved it there in the 20s and they kept running it, the local people. And I mentioned the Sequoia Club. The Sequoia Club was a local civic organization. They don't exist anymore. but. They, they were big into conservation and those types of things. And so a golf course seemed like a good idea. They also were a lot of businessmen, so a golf course seemed like a good idea. <laughs> so the Depression and World War II had a lot of impacts on the course and had trouble keeping it going. Um, by 1931 in the Depression, they were down to 40 members in the golf club. Dues were $2.50 a person for the year. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1937, they were still touting it as an amenity of the town. And steamboat briefs that used to be appear in the paper all the time mentions among the town's amenities a nine-hole golf course. And um, 
the, the only map that I can find shows that it was just east of Lithia Springs. Just so this is Lithia Springs. It's very small here. Uh, you can look at it after the presentation, and they just show the nine-hole golf, golf course. And um, finding any other maps of it is are really difficult. World War II was even more challenging as far as golf in the entire country and in, in the entire world, as you can imagine. Uh, there were shortages of golf equipment of all kinds. As a matter of fact, the federal government banned the manufacturing of go all golf equipment during World War II. A little known fact. And, of course, one of the most precious commodities was the ball, because you needed rubber during World War II. And so there are stories of even prof professional golfers at the time playing not an entire round, but an entire 72-hole tournament with one golf ball. Between <laughs> the ball? Or each person got one ball? Each person. Okay, good. And one person was playing with one ball. So, I, can you imagine that today? It's just not going to happen. So, they had one, they would have one golf ball, or if they were lucky, they had three. Um, this picture, the provenance lists this as being from around 1940. Um, it, it did give permanence to a golf course in Steamboat Springs, and people were like, yeah, we've got a golf course. We've always got a golf course. Um, a friend of my father-in-law's who went to school with him, Joe McGuire Jr., um, wrote to me after I sent him a copy of the book. Uh, if you go to Steamboat Golf Club, on the second tee, there's a plaque. Um, Joe McGuire Sr. died of a heart attack on the second tee at Steamboat Springs Golf Club. And there's a plaque there. And uh, it's a, a memory plaque. He was also a board member, very active in the club. Um, the plaque says something like, we hope he birdied the first hole. Um, <laughs> Ron's wife was on the course that day when, this is Ron Chifley, his wife was on the course that day and she's a nurse um, and she was over on the ninth hole when that, when he had his heart attack. It's not that bit larger distance between the ninth hole and the second tee and he had already passed by the time she could get over to him. Anyway, Joe McGuire Jr. sent me his feedback on the, on the book and um, I didn't realize all of the connections. So he's a friend, he was a lifelong friend of my father-in-law. He was, Joe McGuire was also related to Ray Monson, who was one of the early, early founders of golf in Steamboat Springs. Uh, Ray Monson was his uncle. Um, and Clay Monson, who was also who was involved in every iteration of the go of golf clubs in Steamboat Springs until the Steamboat Golf Club when he passed away. Um, he was a lawyer in town, and he was a city attorney, a county attorney, a district attorney uh, here. So he's very well connected. But I love this quote that he sent to me. I do remember that when I was a teen, early teenager, and that would have been around the early 1950s, my cousin Van Card and I found Uncle Ray's clubs and a box of balls in his garage. Without his knowledge, we absconded with his clubs and balls and might made our way to the course, <laughs> that course that was up there. We had never played golf, so you can imagine that we lost <laughs> most of his balls in the first few holes. There was not much of a course. Describing it as a cow pasture is being very generous, as you can tell. The greens were sand, and the heavy bar that was used to smooth out the sand from the ball to the hole made putting pretty easy. And I don't know if we can get up. Uh, they had sand greens also. So you didn't have a green green, 
you had a sand green, and if you've ever seen a sand green, we'll try and get the, the picture up, but it basically is always a circle, a big circle, and it's all pure sand, and you get to the green, and you pick up your ball, and then they have a rake. It's a rake on one side, and on the other side, it's a bar. And you take that and you roll it from where your ball lands to the hole. So it's a smooth <laughs> surface and it looks like this. And that's how you putt it. So you weren't putting on a regular green that we have today. So I think that that's all the more amazing when you think of the fact that we have Today we go, I've got a hole in one. I've never had it. <laughs> but, you know, there were people, and I talk about a couple of them in the book, that did manage to get holes in one with those kinds of conditions on our, our golf course. And you've got to go, okay, that had to be harder than anything else we've done. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if we can you get want your Yeah, thing? let's see if we can show the okay. sand ready. Green. I guess it just falls So this was an article. There still exist some courses around the country that have sand greens. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Click on that. The, view? The, the, yeah, view the gallery. Right. And let's see if we can get. <laughs> and you can see what this person. So this is this is what I was going to show you. You can see what he's done. He they just drawn that, and that's the sand green that you would have. There are still courses, and they're usually, obviously, in very rural areas. Um, and I've even seen pictures of where they have them bordered by uh, metal barriers, so that the metal barrier keeps the sand in there and it doesn't blow away. <laughs> um, so that's what they were. They, that's what they were dealing with. with. So the second iteration of the golf was a victim of commercialism in Steamboat Springs in the 50s. Um, and this is what I write about in the book. By 1958, ironically the year I was born, uh, the golf course was the victim of commercial development an article in the Steamboat Pilot indicated that the Bachelor Manufacturing Company was planning to build a manufacturing plant on the site of the golf course. The article also indicated that the golf course was no longer operable as it referred to the business site as, quote, taking up most of the land formerly used as a golf course. The land the golf course had sat on had been donated to the town several years ago by the original Steamboat Springs Townsite Company, but there was nothing attached to the donation that stated what the land had to be used for. So by 1958, right around then, the golf course was no more, and it got taken over by what you see now. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a pretty good run when you think about it, that it lasted from the 20s to the 50s, with no support other than individual members paying their two dollars and fifty cents <laughs> no formal greens keepers or any of that they did off and on have a greens keeper that person's job was to collect money once in a while and organize the kiwanis club to go out and help mow the lawn out there and not much else so we get to 1958 and people are going, but I like golf. I want to play golf. What am I supposed to do? Well, for a long time, and this is in the book, what people did was drive. And they drove and drove and drove. They drove to Saratoga, Wyoming to go play golf. They drove uh, down to Rifle. 
they drove all over the place. And finally they said, oh, we got to do something else. So in the early 60s, there were lots of proposals. I don't know how many of you were here in the 60s. I wasn't yet. Ron was. Um, but that's when things were just starting to get going, really, in Steamboat Springs, you know, ski areas getting going, all of those types of things. But along with that comes all of the speculation and all of that. And you go, kind of go, well, I don't know what was going to happen. In 1965, a group of people got together, and Kirk Gibbs owned the Riverbend, Res Riverbend Restaurant, where the Riverbend cabins are west of town now. It used to be a restaurant, and he wanted to make this big resort area. And his golf club would be kind of cool. So what he did was found a bunch of people, like-minded people when they got together. And they said, he said, I'll, long, I'll lease you the land for a dollar a year. And they didn't end up doing the lease because they wanted to own the land. They had learned their lesson. So here's what happens. In May of 1965, a group of local leaders and golf enthusiasts met for dinner and forever changed the history of golf in Steamboat Springs. Gibbs offered to lease the land along the Yampa River to the group for $1 per year, and the Steamboat Golf Association, soon to be the Steamboat Springs Golf Club, came into being and was officially established. Now, a person looking at some of the earlier logos of the Steamboat Springs Golf Club will notice an incongruity with these historical facts. I'm evidence of it today based on the shirt that I'm wearing. <laughs> The plaques celebrating the founding of the club just off the first tee and in the clubhouse list the founding of the club as 1965. As do newspaper accounts of the day. So if you look at these newspaper articles, they're from 1965 when they announced the, the club. Yet some of the logos that were developed in the 1990s and even the subtext of the logo on the club website lists 1964 as the founding. What's the explanation? The story goes that when the logo was being redesigned, the designer was in the clubhouse and asked to the people in the clubhouse, hey, what year was the club founded? A member of the club who also happened to be there at the time offhandedly said 1964 and was taken at his word. By the time it was later pointed out that the plaques and the newspaper articles about the first day of the play that was hanging on the clubhouse wall stated that the correct year was 1965, the logo had already been in use for some time. Since materials and apparel with the 1964 date had already been printed, it was decided that it was just too much trouble and expense to reprint everything. So the other thing that's interesting about Steamboat Springs Golf Course is it's the last golf course that was ever built, designed, maintained, all of that stuff by everyday citizens. This is the design of the Steamboat Springs Golf Course. And as my wife Shauna always says, she says that literally looks like it was written on the back of a napkin. <laughs> and, and it is written on the back of a, a big piece of paper. There's all sorts of other notes about what they should be doing and those types of things. You know, very technical pictures of the trees, their little green circles. Um, <laughs> But this was the design, and this pretty much ended up being the design of the <coughs> golf course. Okay? But it's a true everyman course. It, Dick Bonderson, who was a local attorney, um, his picture is here, was the person that designed the course. He's an attorney, he's not anything, he just <laughs> loved his golf. He was a really good golfer, but he, he just was an attorney. And so they built the course over a two year period. Um, and took two years. And it used to be a bunch of swampland, lots of trees. There's less and less trees every day, mostly because they're just getting old. They're big old cottonwoods. Um, and it was built by donations, 
and by people becoming members. The newspaper used to actually publish. Here are the new members until they got to the first hundred members, uh, partly because Chuck Leckenby, who was the person that was the editor of the paper, was an avid golfer. So he's like, look, we're getting more. So want your name in the paper? Become a member of the golf club. <laughs> um, so then it opened in 1967, and it was the only game in town, but nobody had to drive anywhere. And um, it was a hot ticket. So I came in 1980 uh, to Steamboat Springs. Best thing that ever happened to me. Well, second best thing. Got married. <laughs> uh, but in 1980, um, you had to get on a waiting list to become a member um, because there was only one golf course and somebody had to go off and then you, they had to, and they were limiting memberships. And um, it was the, the focus of golf in town. And then we get to the resort area, or the resort era, which I'm going to call 1974 and beyond. And I would characterize this era as an era of stops, starts, schemes, development, good things, bad things. You just kind of, every year you kind of went, okay, what's the plan this year? So once the ski area was, was built, uh, LTV Aerospace Corporation, who was the original owner of the, the ski area, hired Robert Trent Jones to design a mountain course. Um, so Robert Trent Jones is a very well-known golf architect. But there was not going to be this. <laughs> there was going to be a real design. So if you go to Haymaker or Catamount or, or um, Rolling Stone, you know, they have the professional renderings of what they, they were doing then, and he was the first one. So they announced that they were, in the early 70s, they were going to build the Steamboat Village Inn, which then became the Sheraton, etc., cetera, uh, as a hotel for the base. And they said, and we're going to build a golf course. And in 1974, the front nine opened. And one year later, uh, it opened and was named the Steamboat Village Country Club, which kind of tells you the difference between the resort era and, the, and what I call the everyman era. Mm -hmm. They called it Steamboat Village Country Club. Now, this is one of my favorite stories, because uh, it partially involves a friend of mine. Of mine. On June 27, 1974, the Steamboat Village Golf Course opened its front nine holes. The opening was a private event, and the course spared no expense in bringing in sports celebrities to garner as much publicity as possible. Among those in attendance was legendary golfer Byron Nelson. While Byron Nelson is one of the most famous American golfers in the history of the game, he was not necessarily easily recognizable to the everyday citizen or even avid golfers who were not used to seeing such a celebrity in their midst well before television and all of that, <coughs> so didn't see him. At least one local citizen remembers being at the Steamboat Village Inn and walking down the stairs with a very personable gentleman from Texas. Only after they had parted ways and he had a few moments to think about it did he realize that he had just been having a friendly chat with Lord Byron one of the most famous golfers of his day. So um, those of you that know Kirk Mahaffey, he was the golfer that ran into Lord Byron, and he tells that story of, yeah, I met him. I didn't know I met him at the time, but I met him, and he tells that story. Um, so that golf course was accepted by the city and the citizens because, again, it's a private project no tax dollars. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're gonna build it and they're going to pay for it and they're going to manage it and it's no problem. Then we come into um, 
and, you know, and the Sheraton had its ups and downs. Um, they had some problems with their <coughs> irrigation system. Um, they eventually had to give in and say, yeah, we can't do this all private. And they did a 50-50 split with members of the public and with members of uh, the resort or the private members that own property along the side. Um, that meant that Steamboat Golf Club still was very popular and it, its membership soared to 250 members during that time. Then we have the speculation phase. Um, <laughs> Woodmore and Sky Hitch stagecoach. What, what they were going to build two courses and have 10,000 housing units by 1974. Yeah. Um, Dream on. Did not happen. Steamboat Lakes near Pearl Lake was going to build a course that was going to have 18 holes and 7,500 housing units. That course did not go after various machinations. Um, Catamount originally planned for 12,000 skiers a day, wow. 3,700 dwelling units, 1,000 hotel rooms, 250,000 square feet of commercial space, 10 lifts, one gondola, 59 runs, and 36 holes of golf. Mm. Well, as we all know, that never came. The only thing that came was a very small bit of, of units and, um, and one golf course. It did lead to some of the most contentious land use hearings in the history of this region. Um, they just vastly underestimated the passion that people had for Pleasant Valley and said, no, it's just not going to happen. So now that golf course community only has 25 home sites um, and less than 10% of that land being developed. And, mm -hmm. and you've got the golf course area and then of course you've got the lake house area out there. Um, and it is a totally private club unless you know someone that has a membership, you are not gonna get on there. I have been able to play it twice in my mm -hmm. lifetime both times by little quirks, but um, you know, it's not some place that you can you can get on. Is it a wonderful golf course that you really want to go back there? Or? Uh, it's a nice golf course to play, and I'd go back if somebody invited me, but it's not like I gotta go play that. Okay. The other one that we all know and the story of is what we now have as Haymaker. Haymaker started off being known as Brecken's uh, in 1982. So some developers, Glenn Polk and Gordon and Steve Gunn, who were from originally from Tennessee, were going to propose to build that. Well, they also were building Eagle Ridge. Is it still called Eagle Ridge? Still okay. called Eagle Ridge. So this was during the 80s and, then the, and during the savings and loans crisis, mm. okay? Uh, here's what they had originally planned. Here was their original plan. 27-hole golf course on a 234-acre site, an indoor tennis facility of 37,700 feet, a clubhouse of 46,600 <coughs> feet, swimming, spa, 24,000 of of 24,000 square feet and a 43,500 square feet facility for a clubhouse pond and ice, rink, ice skating rink. Uh, cross country skiing areas, racquetball, squash courts, dining and bar facilities. It would require a membership of 1,000 people. So everybody and I was here that at that time, everybody's eyes kind of went, One, you're gonna get 1,000 people. I mm, don't, we're not sure. So they hired an architect, they started building, they started moving land, and then they went bankrupt. They went bankrupt, Eagle Ridge went bankrupt, 
it was a big sale on the courthouse uh, steps yeah. of everything um, and uh, they even bankrupted a bank uh, that they had gotten the original loans from uh, that was not in Colorado so if you wanted a microcosm of the savings and loan crisis, you couldn't come up with a much better example than what they did. Uh, so, in 1988, people started saying, we got that land, let's, let's build a public course. And here's where our fiscal conservatism comes in. <laughs> our population said, uh-uh, not on my dime. Not, I, I just don't yeah. want to do it. You've got to remember it was during a recession. Um, there was also reluctance for what people were calling down valley sprawl. We didn't want to come in because all the proposals said we're going to build housing units there too. Notice there's no housing units there. Mm -hmm. Still, we got the golf course, but there's no housing units. So uh, Don Lufkin is the one that bought that land and he bought the land, and when I was doing some research recently here at the museum, he's got an industry memoir when he goes through and he talks about Haymaker and, and what <laughs> happened there. And he had originally sold it to some developers that were going to go and they were going to put some uh, other housing units on it. And then he went back to them and <coughs> said, I've changed my mind and I'm willing to pay the penalty. I want that back because I want to preserve the land. Mm -hmm. um, he called what it looked like as, quote, a gravel mine with large berms of rock and dirt. And he was very upset about what it had turned into. So he finally found somebody that was going to buy it, um, some Japanese investors who had worked on golf courses. Mr. and Mrs. Teko Takashama, but they also wanted to put up some housing, and when they found out that the county just finally said, no, no housing. And you got Haymaker is actually on the border between the city and the county, so it led to lots of things, but basically one of the things that it led to was, we're not going to put any housing on there. So eventually, it got sold to the city because the city did decide we do need another golf course. They had done other studies and had found out it's going to bring in a lot of revenue. We'd gotten past the 80s. We were in the 90s. So in 1994, the city bought that land for $1.1 million. That, that's a bargain these days. I mean, $1.1 million for what Haymaker sits on. Um, but Tabor, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, had recently been passed. And we were one of the first votes in the state about Tabor because you had to vote on whether or not the city was going to operate the golf course because that was going to involve tax funds. Um, and they did the vote. There were a bunch of things on the ballot, some stuff for schools, some stuff for roads, and stuff for the golf course. The other first two passed. The one on the golf course failed by 38 votes. So they went back to the drawing board, did a revote, and they put in more specifics, and they specifically put in no housing will be built on this site. And only 100 of the 233 acres will be used for actual golf course land. The rest of it will be wetlands and those types of things. And it passed pretty easily. Um, Steamboat Golf Club was moving along all this time. Rolling Stone, well, what became Rolling Stone, was moving along. And then they finally said, okay, um, we, we've got those golf courses. And then, in night, then when uh, Haymaker opened, it opened to great fanfare. I remember going there and they had uh, a uh, chamber mixer and you could walk the course. And everybody was like, wow, this is going to be a public course. This is nice. So you can debate the merits of 
you know, public course. It's still for a Rock County resident, for I know for me to pay for walking, it's sixty eight dollars, I believe, this year. Um, but that's still a relative bargain in some in some golfing communities. Um, Steamboat Golf Club went through several phases where they said we should expand. We should go over the over here to the, across the highway. We should do all of these things. Um, but the board had a lot of fiscal conservatives on it, some of which were my friends, and they said no. So it remains a landlocked nine-hole golf course that a lot of people love. I mean, being one of them and play very regularly, um, but it will always be a nine-hole golf course. Um, with all of the stories that I've told you, I want to leave some time for any questions here. Um, I'm reminded of something that I read recently. I, I'm a big reader also, and I try and split. I read a nonfiction book, then I read a fiction book. And then, but I read a recent quote, and I thought, this is perfect. And the quote was, memory can be an unreliable guide to history. <laughs> and that is why I always defer to written records, and I use the stories that I hear from people, and then I go, that's a good story, but I need to put it down as a story, and then I need to see what I can find in written records. But I, I always remember that because somebody the other day says, what you wrote in there, I know it's not right. And I said, well, do you have the records of it? I'm like, well, no. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go with the written records of it. Um, and the last thing that I'll say before I open up to questions is uh, when I play at Steamboat Golf Club, which I do four times a week, Retirement is wonderful. <laughs> I look around that course and I think of the, all the changes that it's gone through. Gone through in the time that I've been there. I've been a member for about 40 years now. Uh, and as all the old cottonwoods fall and new trees are planted, and I think normal everyday people with everyday jobs built this course with their hands and their own equipment. I, I do the same when I look at, when I go out and play at Haymaker. I'm just glad it was preserved the way it was. You go out, go out to Haymaker and just look around, and what a wonderful 360 degree view of the valley. Uh, on the rare occasion when I get to play at Rolling Stone, I marvel at the scenery, and you just go, wow, especially that back nine that goes into Fish Creek Canyon. And you just, this is really cool. And I think, you know, we might be a winter wonderland, but spring and summer and early fall is pretty darn good. Uh, I remember when I first came here, people said, you know, a lot of people come for the winter and stay, stay for the summers, and that's what keeps them here. Uh, so I, I think that that's, that's why I'm here. Uh, I couldn't even come close. I just read a couple sections uh, from the, the book that I wrote, there's, there are a lot of stories in here about the ins and outs of that. Uh, thank you to those of you that have already purchased the book and those of you that have supported me in this process, thanks to my wife who I go down to my office, what are you doing? I'm doing historical research. What are you doing? I'm working on writing the book. What are you doing? I got the edits back and I'm trying to figure, it's, it's good for you. <laughs> she, I think she was mostly saying, Glad you have something to do in retirement. <laughs> uh, so I'll end there uh, with my formal comments and I'll open it up to any questions that you guys have about anything else. Yes? So I'm not a golfer. Okay. Um, so the first question is how many golf courses are there in Steamboat? And I read about the decline in popularity of golf. Are any in trouble? What do you think? Will there be that number in 10 okay. years? What, sure. What's your sense? Um, so in Steamboat Springs, we have Catamount, Haymaker, Rolling Stone, and Steamboat Golf Club. There's also an ultra, ultra, ultra private that is actually like five or six holes, and I'm the name's escaping me right now. Um, 
but it was built by um, the uh, two of the guys that were on the board of Augusta National. <laughs> so they had a lot of money. Uh, only 16 families have access to that course, or ever will. So you're you're not going to get on that. Course. One of the guys is pain. Pain, yeah. And so they they've got. Uh, so we technically have the five, but we really have four, and we really have three, because you can't get onto Catamount very much. Uh, and then you've got um, you've got the you have the Valley Golf Course in Craig, which is a nice nice course, and it's an 18 hole course. Uh, as far as golf and what's going on with it. Golf went way up over the last two years in participation because of COVID. It was one of the few things people could go out and do and play and stuff. So it had huge rises in numbers. Well, now we're in a little bit of a recession and, or the start of what people think and they're cutting back. So there's a little bit of a cutback, but I don't know based upon I'm, when I'm out on the course, there's still an awful lot of people out there. So I think golf will all, always be around. The other threat that I see that is emerging is water. And that um, I just saw the other day, the city of Aurora is planning to put a moratorium on building any more golf courses. And a lot of cities around the country are actually plowing under their golf courses just to say, we can't afford the water anymore. But I think golf will always be around in some form. Um, but I think we had a rise in COVID. We're going to have a little bit of a decrease. But there's still always going to be a, a bunch of people. You know, you had the tiger effect. You had all sorts of things. Who <laughs> yes. owns the Schemo Golf Club members? Or? Members. That is a members owned golf club. So there are 100 members that are what are called equity members. So they bought in. Uh, they pay their annual membership. If that course is ever sold, then those equity members split the proceeds. Do they ever resell them? Yes. And as a matter of fact, I don't even think all 100, we have all 100 memberships currently sold because a lot of people don't want to commit to just that. A lot, what a lot of golfers like to do is go to lots of different golf courses. Um, but um, yeah, it's capped at 100 members and they are technically the owners of that club. Are there many other clubs around the state that are like that? Where the you know, I don't know the, the answer to that question. I think that's a fairly unusual arrangement um, where the members actually own it. You have like a country club that owns it and you're a member of the country club but you don't have an equity stake in the country club in those types of things. You have a lot of things like either the privates or the resort courses, like Rolling Stone or city-owned courses and those types of things. So I think it is fairly unusual. Yeah. Why do you think that uh, concrete tee box is alive and well on our number eight? It feels like that, doesn't it? You know, the nice thing though that, you know, that tee box is flat. Yeah. A lot of the tee boxes uh, at Steamboat Golf Club are going to have a little bit of humps to them, and you're going, where do I put this ball so that I can hit it well? Um, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I just think that's a hysterical picture. And I really like the golfing out, the formal golfing wear there, you know, it's got the. I can't tell if it's a bowler or a cowboy hat and a long sleeve shirt and jeans. And, uh, I'm sure he doesn't have uh, golf shoes on. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I think that's a great picture to tell you about. We had golf, sort of. <laughs> the people were going to call it. What golf. about women? Oh, there, I actually put a lot of stuff in here. I would find stuff about women. Uh, so one of the more interesting things for the museum is that Dorothy Wither, who was one of the founding members of this museum and of CMC, she was an amazing woman, um, was one of the first members of the Steamboat Golf Club. She's in the top. She was one of the first 10 members, bought her membership. 
But Dorothy Wither was a smart woman. What she would do is she joined the, the uh, ladies club, part of the ladies club, so when they would have their meetings, she would have the meetings, they would have the meetings, and there would be a fashion show with it because Dorothy Wither owned the, the, the Dorothy shop downtown, and so that also served as another marketing thing. Um, but yeah, women have always been a part of it. Um, Shannon Hanley, who is still in town, she's the woman's golf course, uh, golf coach for Steamboat Springs High School, uh, was a professional golfer, had a lot to do with women's golf in the Valley. She started the Swiggle League, which is the Women's Inter-Golf League, uh, Steamboat Women's Inter-Golf League, Swiggle. Uh, and she founded that purely to start getting women together and to socialize so, so they'd get out of their silos of their just the individual golf clubs. Uh, and it's become quite the thing over the years. Um, so we've had some really notable things there. So de despite the fact that some people want to say, ah, oh, women golfers, like, yeah, they get to play too. Yeah, and a lot of them are a lot better than me. <laughs> so, um, other questions? Well, thank you, Mari. That was so fun. Thank you. <laughs>